So may that same yearning and readiness that we have for the spring to warm up and for the color to be here be that same readiness that we bring for this season of Jesus Christ's resurrection and being ready to be fed by the new life and the promise that this Easter season gives us. So this is the season that's all about Jesus and, and his resurrection. And so we are looking to him as the living word of God. And, and we know him now um, because that resurrection happened a few thousand years ago through scripture. And so we're looking at Jesus and scripture and that relationship yesterday, last Sunday, yesterday, uh, we talked about how Jesus is the definitive and the unmitigated word of God, meaning that scripture is composed of human authors who are divinely inspired, um, but that human authorship means that there's some limitation that comes in scripture. But Jesus is the word of God that is the word of God. There's no human authorship because he is the divine son of God. And so when we have trouble with scripture and are trying to figure it out in the places where it contradicts itself, we look to Jesus as our final authority to help us resolve that and find our way forward. And so as we're looking to Jesus um, and looking in terms of how we live out our own faith, today is kind of a fun one, and it's going to be about how Jesus studied the scriptures. And so figured that's good to know because if that's the way Jesus did it and it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. And that's, okay, I'm trying to be funny. Not at all? Come on. <laughs> then that's an exciting way to look at it. And, and this is a moment where we remember um, that Jesus grew up and, and was human as much as he was fully divine and was steeped um, in the Jewish tradition. And so real fast um, in looking at what it means for the living word of God to be steeped in the written word of God, that written word of God is going to just be the Hebrew Bible. And I use Hebrew Bible instead of Old Testament because it's not old for our Jewish brothers and sisters. This is their scripture and their Bible. Um, and it's arranged a little bit differently than we have it arranged in our scripture. So just um, a real brief overview. Um, it's called the Tanakh. So the Torah is the law. Um, and those are the first five books um, of the Hebrew Bible. And we can, we're just not going to get into when it was written. Um, but So we have a grouping of the law, and this is the primary um, scripture uh, grouping. So this, this takes um, precedence over, over other scriptures, even in the Hebrew Bible. Go ahead. So we've got the law, and then we've got the prophets. And so you'll notice that it's just one book of Samuel and one book of Kings instead of how we break it out. Um, and, and then all of those Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, and so on are all grouped into the book of the 12. Um, and so these are the prophets. Um, these come a little bit later from the law. Um, and these are the two groupings, the law and the prophets, that would have been canonized, that would have been made official during Jesus' time. While Jesus was living, um, this last grouping had not been brought into the Hebrew Bible yet, the writings, but were a part of the life um, of the Jewish people. It just hadn't been canonized, and it was canonized at the end of the first century CE, so way after Jesus' death, and because of Jesus' death. So we have a new group coming through um, called Christians now. And so it was important for the Jewish people to define um, who were not following Jesus as a Messiah, what the scriptures were um, to help with the confusion um, since we all started as Jewish. And so that includes um, the Psalms. And so when Jesus is quoting scripture that we have in the Gospels, um, it primarily comes from Deuteronomy, from Isaiah, and from the Psalms, which is one book from each of these three sections. And so that's just a brief overview, and we'll get into the time periods and what it means to be canonized more next Sunday after church. We have a conversation on scripture, so if, you, if that raised questions for you, get them jotted down and come on next Sunday. All right, so Jesus studying scripture. You all know the first passage that we have about this, right? 
Oh, come on, y'all. Don't leave me hanging up here. Jesus studies scripture. How early? As a child. Yeah. So Mary and Joseph lose him, and where do they find him? In the temple. All right. Good. Okay. Whew, we didn't know it. All right. So... Um, when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual to the festival. The festival was ended. This was Passover, and they started to return because it's all everybody together. And so, of course, Joseph has the kid. Of course, Mary has the kid. Oh, wait. Nobody had the kid. And so they run back and start looking for him and, um, what, in Jerusalem. And after three days, right, that's a lot of studying in the temple. Who here has studied in the temple for three days? Yeah, all right, all right, you got it, Kevin. Bring it on. All right, and so they find him sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and at his answers. Jesus is about building that brick house. Ain't no wolf gonna huff and puff and blow it down. He's gonna know it. All right, and so this is the call to steep ourselves, to know it, to be so excited that we spend three days or three years in seminary or however much time we want to give to studying this and to knowing it. So may we start early and may we hold that beauty for our kids as we are raising them as well. And then we keep going, right? Because there are going to be evil wolves out there, and so we've got to have a strong core. And that core, that as Jesus is reading these scriptures as a child, would have been the core of the law. And that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. So may this be the very lifeblood of every moment of your day. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. If you don't know anything else, know this. Know that the Lord our God is one and that we are called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And Jesus put that into action at that temple in Jerusalem in spending his time. And the next moment we see Jesus is at his baptism and he has this beautiful moment of the sky opening up and the dove descending and the voice of God resounding this is my son my beloved with whom I am well pleased and in the midst of that wonderful moment what does that Holy Spirit do right after drives him out into the wilderness so all right we've got this central pivotal moment okay now can it hold up in a life where there are big wolves huffing and puffing and ready to blow our faith and our house down. And this is the temptation in the wilderness where he's fasting and then where the devil comes and says, if you're the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. And Jesus says, mm -mm. I remember my teaching and my upbringing. And so it goes back to Deuteronomy 8. Remember the long way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness in order to humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. So before Jesus brings ministry, he goes back to this exact pivotal moment in his own people's history of being brought forth out of slavery and learning the commandments of God, right? We have the Ten Commandments that Moses came and gave the people. But it's one thing to know it. Can we actually build it? And so this is, as Jesus is in his own temptation, he is remembering the temptation of his ancestors. And how God tested them and how he, God humbled them by letting you hunger, then by feeding you manna, which neither you nor your ancestors were acquainted, in order to make you understand that one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so Jesus 
withstood that first temptation because he knew what was evil and he didn't fall for it because of how strongly rooted he was in scripture. So the devil tries again. And this is why we're studying scripture because, oh wait, I skipped one ahead. All right, skip that transition. And to you I will give glory and all authority of all of these kingdoms. And I will give it to anyone I please if you will worship me. And then it will be yours. And Jesus has answered him from, again, Deuteronomy, this time chapter 6. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. All of that power to do good might be great, except if I am not worshiping God, then all of that power will crumble, just like those straw houses and those stick houses. The Lord your God you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name alone you shall swear. So we know who we are and whose we are, and we do not deviate from that. And it's really important for us to have that core and for us to study scripture and to know not only the scripture itself, but who God is and to have that allegiance with God because other people, including the devil, are going to come quoting scripture to us. And just because someone can quote scripture and knows the word of God doesn't mean they know the will of God. And so this is why we study. This is why we know the passages, we know the specific trees, but it's also why we know the forest. Because you can easily separate them and play them against each other. And this is what Jesus was able to withstand because not only did he know scripture, he knew God and had a living relationship with God. And so when the devil says, you know, it's going to be fine for you to throw yourself off the temple because God will command his angels concerning you to protect you. It's scripture. You can't debate that. And Jesus answered him, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And that again comes from Deuteronomy 6. And that again comes from this time period of the Jewish people leaving slavery. And so he, Jesus learned the lesson that his forebears passed down through scripture and didn't fall for the devil's temptation. And that's when... The devil's like, oh, well, not going to get anything through here today, so I'll leave for a more opportune time. So this is not something that we can ever be like, hey, I went through Sunday school. I know scripture. I've got this. Powers of evil are real. The wolf will wait. If it can't blow that, chim that house down, then it's going to find a chimney, Right? This is the story. So we have to be ready. We can't just stop studying. This is a living word that will unfold and will give us power for every single step and aspect and chapter of our lives. And if we don't steep ourselves in it continually, then that means we're not going to have that brick house. You know, Kelsey and Corey just bought a house. If anyone, they know it's going to take constant maintenance to keep it up, right? We know these things for our church. Ask any trustee, right? We have landscaping day next week, right, Randy? Because it doesn't stay done. So why do we think our spiritual lives stay done? This is a constant relationship. It's a living one, all right? And so Jesus begins his ministry. He knows what he's going to say no to. And now we come to the choir's anthem because scripture is also helps us in knowing what our call is. What is it that the word that God needs to send out through us? And what is it that we need to do so that word does not return to God empty? but is fulfilled. And so Jesus has said his no, and now he's going to say his yes. And he's in Nazareth. He survived the devil, and he is at the synagogue, unrolls the scroll, and says, this is going to sound familiar. Get ready for it. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Anybody? Rob? Says something familiar? Right? 
Now, when Isaiah wrote these words, this was for a people returning from Babylonian exile, returning to reclaim their faith because finally the Babylonians were overthrown by the Persians and Cyrus set them free. This had nothing to do with Jesus when Isaiah wrote these words. This was a living word of hope for a people remembering who they were, and as they go back to rebuild Jerusalem, as they go back out of exile to their home, to know who they are and what they're going to build and how they're going to build it. And just as that word was true for them in the 600s BCE, excuse me, the 500s BCE, that's true for Jesus 500 years later as he finds his ministry, not under Babylonian oppression, but under Roman occupation. And so he begins proclaiming a word that was true then to a word that is true now, to a word that now we are encountering 2,000 years later and finding truth ourselves. This is what it means to have an ancient, present, living word. And may we, like Jesus, find what our calling is in scripture, in its study, in worship with one another. But life is a little bit more complex than knowing a no and a yes, right? Unfortunately, it'd be a lot easier if we could just be like, no, 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 yes, no, 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 yes, yes, yes. But there are going to be weavings that come, and Jesus encountered this as well. And so what do we do when the living word that we are encountering was at a different time? And there are things that we are encountering in our own time, in our own context, that wasn't a part of life then. How do we figure it out? How how do we know which way is faithful and of God and what way is not? And so Jesus gives us an insight into that and looking to the law of Moses. So this is the law that um, we'll be looking at from the gospel according to Matthew. Suppose a man enters into marriage with a woman. This comes from Deuteronomy, from Moses. But she does not please him because he finds something objectionable about her. And so he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, sends her out of his house. She then leaves his house and goes off to become another man's wife. Then suppose the second man dislikes her. Can we have a moment for this poor woman? Writes her a bill of divorce, puts it in her hand, sends her out of his house, or the second man who marries her dies. Um, Her first husband who sent her away is not permitted to take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled. Say what? Um, For that would be abhorrent to the Lord. Say what? And you shall not bring guilt on the land that the Lord your God is giving you as a possession. What? Okay, so now we come to Jesus. I'm going to skip. And so if we can go to Matthew chapter 19. Yep. All right. And so now some Pharisees who are in charge of the law, and please don't immediately think of Pharisees as bad people. These are people living under Roman occupation who are doing their best to preserve a religion and a cultural identity that is threatened um, to be obliterated. And so their job is the job to take this law and figure out how to faithfully apply it. And so some Pharisees can't come to Jesus to test him. Not all tests are, have great motives, but we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? Jesus answered, you have, have you not read that the one who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Anybody been to a wedding lately? And so the Pharisees said to Jesus, well, why then did Moses command us to give a certificate of dismissal to divorce her? He said to them, it was because you were so hard-hearted that Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for unchastity and marries another commits adultery. Now, there's a ton to get into here, but 
we'll leave that for another day. Um, so we're not here for three hours and three days like Jesus was. But what I want to look at in this passage is that Jesus suggests that the law of Moses, if we could go back to the 19, Barry, um, wasn't the full will of God. That even though it was a word of God, it did not fully capture God's will. Because it was a certain period of time with certain limitations that he names as hard-hearted um, that led them to be, well, given this, let's just get here because that's at least a step better, even though it's not fully what God intends for us. This is why we are studying scripture the way that we are. Because Jesus himself gives room for human authorship and human limitation that doesn't quite get to the full truth of God. And so this is why as we as United Methodists understand that scripture contains everything that is necessary for salvation, that it does include human limitation along with its divine inspiration. And so we come to Jesus as our final authority to help us figure that out. I'm going to complicate it one step further, buckle your chin straps with me, and, and come to small groups and ask questions, and come next Sunday and ask questions. Because just as scripture is both human and divine, Jesus is both human and divine. And so there's going to be a moment where Jesus witnesses to us what to do when we are confronted with the limitations of our own truth. This is why we are in Bible study. This is why we do our faith journey together because we are finite beings and we will never know the full truth. And Jesus in his full humanity has that moment as well. A Canaanite woman comes to Jesus to ask for 15, sorry, um, for her to heal her daughter, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. Jesus did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, send her away. She keeps shouting after us. And so he says, okay, fine, I'll say something. And looks at her and says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Your gender's wrong. Your race is wrong. Your religion is wrong. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered again, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And she says, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. You might have the wrong gender, you might have the wrong race, you might have the wrong religion, but great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed. We can go into how much was going on in Jesus' world right now and how little his margin was. We all have those days of stress. Every parent knows that one question that just cracks you um, that your child asks. This is a moment where Jesus, God's self, the second person of the Trinity, gives room for greater truth than what he was willing to first allow. May we go through life this humbly. If Jesus can let himself be corrected by someone who is of the wrong gender, the wrong religion, and the wrong race, then may we be open to the truth that each of us bring to this journey. Because we're going to need it to survive. Because when Jesus is on the cross, he's going to cry out, Eli, Eli, lemak sabatani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is the cry of Psalm 22. We all know Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But Psalm 22 Starts, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, 
enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you, our ancestors, trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved, and you they trusted and were not put to shame. Do not put me to shame. Deliver me. This is the prayer of Jesus in the midst of a violent death and ending. We can center ourselves in God making a way where there was no way. Then when we are on a cross, when the ways before us have all shut down, we have somewhere to turn, to still believe, to still hope, to still pray. The gospel according to Luke ends differently, and this is your teaser for next week. We'll talk about why next week. Ends with Jesus praying, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. William Barclay suggests that this is the prayer Jewish mothers taught their children from Psalm 35, 31, verse 5. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Scripture is our way to survive. It is our way to know what to say no to. It is our way to know what to say yes to. It is our way to figure out the messiness of everything in between. And it's no small thing that when Jesus returned from resurrection, he led the two on the road to Emmaus through that exact process of taking their grief, their fear, their hopes, and their anxieties and taking them back to scripture, Mary, and explaining every aspect to them. Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. May we take this seriously, and thank you for taking it seriously enough today to give us extra time in worship, because this is a lot. This is a whole life's worth of a lot. So may we do it with heart, soul, mind, and strength. Our discipleship commitment is to spend some time in Scripture and to spend some time reflecting on the way we typically approach Scripture and the way some of the things that we might be missing from that approach and some ways to do some more study so that that ancient present word can come that much more alive in our lives and so that no wolf can huff and puff and blow our house down.